And then Buddhism began to spread, mostly peacefully. Uh, they would meet together in their sanghas during the, like I said, yeah, just, just, just a few some minutes ago. They would gather together in their in their sanghas, and uh, then uh, during the dry season, they would go out in twos and threes and so forth, and teaching the philosophy of Buddhism. And so slowly, slowly, Buddhism began to began to prosper, began to spread. Now, oftentimes, uh, Buddhism. Uh, also got a political boost. Um, uh, oftentimes it would marry itself, it would unite with the political order uh, to help to carry it forward. Um, for example, Thailand, I referred to Thailand just a bit ago, and uh, in Thailand the whole Buddhist system has become very, very strongly uh, linked with the uh, with the political system and with the uh, with the emperor, who uh, has uh, the responsibility to care for the Emerald Buddha, as I mentioned. This is the name of Bangkok within Buddhist lingo in uh, Thailand: City of the Great Angel or God, Angel who will not die or does not deteriorate, Diamond. Indra, God who does not die, invincible and cannot be defeated, the great, the earth, world, earth, the cycle of life, death or rebirth, eternal suffering, nine precious stones, diamond, ruby, emerald, topaz, garnet, sapphire, pearl, zikran, gem, throne of an eternal angel, angel of reincarnating into the earth, Indra, king of the land, not I, or Rama, of Hinduism, owner of all treasures. <laughs> the name of the city of Bangkok. Amazing. Now, it would be interesting to have someone from Thailand here and who could describe this city's name in Thai. I have it written here, but I can't begin to, to pronounce the names, you know. But here is an example of a political, cultural system uh, merging with a religious system and coming together in an amazing way so that both are dependent on the other and both help the other, the political and the religious, the religious and the political. And that has been, that has been quite typical of Buddhism uh, as, as it has spread. And very, very especially so in, in India, actually. In, um, in 273 BC, this is uh, just, uh, you know, this is a couple hundred years after, after Buddha himself. There was an a, 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 um, emperor in, uh, in India, Asoka, who was a very violent man. And remember that Buddhism began on the borderlands of India, and it spread through India uh, somewhat, slowly. He's a very violent man, and some Buddhist monks got a hold of him and uh, reprimanded him for his violence, for his cruelty, and helping him see that this is bad dharma, and uh, can well cause a lot of trouble in the next life if he's not careful, you see. And so he literally made a turnaround. Instead of being this Hindu um, imperial king, <laughs> he turned around and abandoned all of that and embraced Buddhism and had Buddhist monks teach him the way of Buddhism. And he traveled through India, and everywhere he went, he established Buddhist Sanghas. And so this political emperor embraces Buddhism, uses his political power and his wealth to spread Buddhism through India, and to build Sanghas across the country. And so Buddhism very quickly took very deep root within, um, within India under Asoka's political leadership. just as happened in Bangkok that I described a bit ago. So here you see again Buddhism linking with a political system and using that political system as, uh, as the driver who helps Buddhism to spread uh, beyond, uh, from, from country to country. And it did spread. It spread not only to India, but to Sri Lanka, on into China, on all the way up to Japan. It spreads and it spreads and it spreads. But not always peacefully. 
even with Ahsoka. Remember, he was a military officer, uh, so not always peacefully. I know one of my visits to China at one of the Buddhist uh, centers there, I was, and, and going into this huge Buddhist temple, I was amazed at how many of the, uh, of the uh, uh, figures on the walls of the temple were very violent, you know, swords and fighting and all that kind of thing. And then out in the fields beyond, you saw young men doing martial arts and so forth. This is all Buddhism, you see, using this kind of military stuff um, as an indication of, um, of uh, in that temple, of, of the way in which Buddhism had spread in that part of China. And then you have Zen Buddhism. Zen Buddhism, which uh, says that you need to really uh, discipline yourself and be ready to take a very sharp surprise upon your body. And the electric shocks that come from the surprise will send your uh, Buddha essence power through your whole being. And so oftentimes the surprise becomes a big whack on your back, you know. So you have these monks walking around with these uh, novices trying to learn to be good monks and they'll give them a big whack on the back, bang, you know. And that bang, the shock of that bang is supposed to send Buddha power through you. And then Buddhism died in India. It was no more. It completely vanished. Why? Why did that happen? If you're going to kill Buddhism, what would you do? And a lot of it was Islamic influence. As Muslim empire spread through India, Buddhism eventually died. How would you kill Buddhism if you wanted to kill it? What would you do to strangle it so it could not exist anymore? What would you do? What would the strategy be? Ah, very simple. Close the sanghas. Close the monasteries. Close them down. If you close down the monasteries, Buddhism cannot survive. Remember, there's three refuges. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the sangha, the monastery and I take refuge in the Dharma. Why is the Sangha so important? I mentioned it's very important because you cannot practice Buddhism unless you have an opportunity, fully, unless you have an opportunity to live in the Sangha. You've got to be in the Sangha if you're going to, if you're going to uh, follow Buddhism. And that's what they did. That's what the Muslims did. They just closed down the Sanghas. And then when the communists took over China, and the Mongolian and so forth, they did the same thing. They closed down the Sanghas so that there was no more monasteries and Buddhism just slowly was strangled to death and eventually it vanished. It was no more. I mean, the, the ethics of the Sangha, listen to the ethics of the Sangha and you'll see why you have to have the Sangha in order, to, in order for Buddhism to survive because who can practice these ethics out in the real world? Listen to them. Refrain from destroying life. Everybody can do that, okay? Do not take what is not given. Stop stealing. Okay, everyone can do that and should do that. Abstain from sexual aberrations. Everyone can do that. Abstain from wrongful sex. Do not lie or deceive. We can all do that. Don't lie or deceive. Eat moderately and not afternoon. Well, that's a little difficult to not eat afternoon. You almost have to be in a monastery to practice that. Do not look at dancing, singing, or dramatic spectacles. That's kind of tough in a world in which dancing and singing and so forth is on every hand. Do not affect to use garlands, scents, ungans, or ornaments. No ornaments. Well, that's getting pretty ascetic, isn't it, for most people. Don't use high or broad beds. Sleep in narrow and low beds. Well, that's pretty tough, isn't it? Don't accept gold or silver. And so of these basic principles, half of them <laughs> are expected of all society. Don't lie and don't steal and so forth like that. Yeah, that's normally expected, isn't it? But some of this other stuff that must be practiced, these 10 principles, are really not very applicable in the world in which we live, in which the societies in which we live. And so you need, you need, you need the monastery. And those eight 
principles that we talked about, right meditation and so forth and so forth, you really need a monastery to do that, you see. And so people in Buddhist countries all over the world will spend some time in monasteries, maybe a few months, maybe a lifetime, trying to develop the skills to put all of this stuff to practice. If you want that to die, just close the monasteries and Buddhism withers away and it dies out. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. As India was moving towards, towards um, independence, this Bimrao, Ramji came on the scene. Now, who is Bimrao Ranji? He was an outcast Dalit. You remember we talked about Hinduism, what the outcasts are, 200 million of them? Their rights are abrogated in the caste system. Bimrao was an outcast Dalit. He had no power within the Hindu system. But amazingly, he was an extremely capable person. Amazingly, he required the position of Minister of Justice as India moved to its independence. And what did he give himself to do when he became Minister of Justice? He began to address the caste system and sought with all of his might to bring it to an end. Gandhi was furious. Gandhi never wanted the caste system to be abrogated. Gandhi believed the way you develop a truly healthy pluralist society is through caste, but get rid of the abuses, destroy the abuses. But Bhim Rao would not back down. He struggled mightily to pass laws in India that brought about enormous transformations in the regulations in regards to caste and other injustices in India. He really laid the foundations for an independent modern day India in which justice would be highly embraced and respected. In fact, he was so influential that <laughs> he even managed to get the Buddha symbol on the Indian flag. So the Indian flag carries the Buddha symbol. Isn't that something? And so after a thousand years, behold, Buddhism returns to India under Bhim Rao's leadership and begins to affect the culture in very amazing ways. And that's true as well today, especially among the Dalit. A lot of Dalit have been, have been becoming uh, Buddhists because um, of their, um, of, of, because of their uh, concern about Indian caste systems and the struggle for justice and so forth, which they feel Buddhism can help them support in that commitment. So welcome to Buddhism. Very diverse, very interesting, very attractive to many people today, particularly in the West, who sort of want to drop out from our materialistic, uh, the geared cultures, a, a, a faith that calls for meditation and that kind of thing. Pretty attractive for many people. Um, and as I said in India, very influential in bringing about some basic fundamental changes in regards to justice in regards to the caste system under this Bhim Rao's leadership. 